Well, uh, I'd like for you to welcome Andy Applebaum. He's going to give a presentation here and instruct us on how to stop, drop, and assess your sock. Cool. Uh, thanks. All right, can you guys hear me okay? I'm coming out okay? I'm gonna louder, okay. I'm going to try to talk louder. Um, cool. So my name's Andy. I work at MITRE. Are you guys familiar with MITRE? Awesome. I don't have to say what MITRE is because I always uh, bungle. The... Anyway, I work on MITRE's attack framework. Are you guys also familiar with attack? That's good to hear because I have slides on attack, but I don't have too many, so I'm, I'm glad. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about kind of a methodology that you can use to try to assess your sock using attack as a scorecard. And to kind of lead off, I'm going to, you know, traditionally when we talk about network defense, we have this tendency to treat our network as a castle and focus on the perimeter. And, and that's not as, not as true today as it was a few years ago, but there's certainly a mentality that says, I need to focus on my network perimeter. That's all that matters. If I patch and remediate all these vulnerabilities, no one's ever going to get in. And the reality is that's not true. Adversaries will find a way. They'll always find a way to get in. There's always going to be something that's going wrong. And at the end of the day, if you're really only looking at those walls of your network, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. I think most of you might be familiar with the Pyramid of Pain. Are you guys familiar with the Pyramid of Pain? That sounds like a yes, some, some head nods. This is basically things that are kind of easy for adversaries to change. or th th This is kind of a representation of things that are hard for an adversary to change versus things that are easy for us to detect. So hash values are, are really easy to kind of like for us to look for, but they're very easy for an adversary to change. IP addresses are similarly easy. They just kind of, you know, di di different infrastructure, domain names, network and host artifacts. And at the top of the pyramid are adversary behaviors or te tactics, techniques, and procedures. These are the hardest things for adversaries to change when they attack, attack our networks. And if we can start looking for adversaries by looking for their TTPs, we're going to do better at actually finding them. And so that's where attack comes in is we're moving away from IOCs, we're moving away from hash values and IP addresses, and instead we're taxonomizing what attackers are actually doing at the behavioral level. And here's kind of what, what attack is. Um, I just want to point out it's globally accessible, which means it's on the internet, attack.miter.org. You can go there right now. You can go there at any point in time. It's totally free. It's available. We put it out there. Please use it. Use attack. Attack is amazing. Um, there's a lot of hard questions that you want to ask when you're trying to implement defenses in your network. The first is, how do I actually move up the pyramid of pain and implement TTP-based detection? You also might want to ask, how effective is my defense? It's one thing to just throw tools into your network, but it's another to say, hey, here are these tools in my network and here's how effective they are at detecting things. You might also want to ask, what's my detection coverage against, say, APT28 or 29, since you know, we've, we've all been reading the news. You know, you might want to. You might wonder. Well, here's this APT. They're active. They're targeting people. How do how do my defenses stack up against the things that they're doing? And then, as you're instrumenting uh, sensors on your network, you might want to ask, Hey, is this data that I'm collecting? All these logs I'm forwarding into Splunk. Are these actually helping me? Are these useful? What can I detect by using these things? Then the last thing you might want to do, and, and and this is you know not not a full enumeration. But you might want to say, hey, is this new product from this vendor that's getting all this buzz everywhere, is that actually going to benefit my, my network? If I go implement that, is that going to provide some new capability that I wouldn't otherwise have? And these are all questions that we hope to address kind of using attack or there's some way to address using attack and kind of help move you from that perimeter-based model and, and to something that's more kind of holistic where you understand more about your network. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about attack. I'll try to keep it brief since it seems like most of you have heard about attack. But you know, traditional uh, traditional sock defense focuses on that left of exploit kill on the left of exploit kill chain phases, reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, and mainly exploitation. Attack for enterprise, and it's, I'm going to say mainly attack focuses on the right of exploit kill chain phases, and that's really kind of breaking down that control, execute, and maintain into you know, high level adversary tactical goals. These are things like initial access, persistence, privilege escalation, lateral movement, exfiltration. Cre mentioned credential access, right? That's a fun one. I like that one a lot. Um, but these are kind of breaking down those kind of high level, like here are these kill chain phases into, hey, here are these adversary tactical goals. 
And then in the attack model itself, instead of just enumerating the, these tactical goals, we also talk about the techniques that are, that, that are the actual things, the behaviors the adversary executes to achieve their tactical goals. And then along with the techniques, we enumerate groups, you know, the threat actors, with links to the techniques that, that we've seen them using in publicly available uh, threat reporting literature. Then lastly, we include a little bit of software in there as well. That includes built-in utilities, because a lot of adversaries love living off the land, as well as custom malware, all linked to the techniques that they're able to execute. And so this is just a quick snapshot of the attack, uh, the attack for enterprise matrix. It's grown a lot over the years, and I'm going to have different matrices throughout this talk. I think mine are a little dated. I don't have initial access in there. But this is, I think, the one that was most current as of April 2018. And you can see at the top level we have the tactics. These are, these are each column is a tactic. You, one of the downsides of having this model expand over time is it's harder and harder to read on a slide. Um, you have the tactics, and then within each tactic, you have the techniques that the adversary is that the adversary uses to achieve those tactical goals. And here's an example, kind of in the top. You can kind of see it there. You have scheduled task, and then that kind of gets blown up in the attack framework itself. We have a description, we have examples, we have a little bit of information about the technique in the actual model, as well as specific technique implementations linking out to the threat actor groups and the software that can execute them. And all this is available at attack.miter.org. Um, I'm not going to go in too into it, but there are four key points I like to make about attack. The first is that the framework is grounded in real data from cyber incidents. Everything is backed by either like common red team knowledge or publicly available th uh, threat reporting information. That's one of the key differentiators of attack is that we're not just like enumerating these things we've read about in papers. We are you know kind of kind of like theoretical attacks. We're really talking about the things that adversaries do execute and that we've seen them executing. Attack also allows you to, or one of the key things that Attack does is it enables you to pivot between your red team and your blue team. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully going to talk a little bit about that later in the talk. But it basically gives you a common language that both your red team and your blue team can, can, can speak to as they're working in your network. Then lastly, or not lastly, this is number three. This is my favorite. Attack decouples the problem of understanding what adversaries are doing from the solution, you know, the defensive thing that you'd want to do. So we've just gone and said, hey, here are all these adversary behaviors. Here's all these things that they're doing. You can go figure out what kind of thing you want to do. Do you want to focus on detection? Do you want to focus on remediation? Do you want to fo focus on mitigation? Attack is agnostic to that. Attack just talks about and really focuses on what the adversary is doing. Then lastly, Attack helps transform your thinking by focusing on post-exploit adversary behavior. And this goes back to the castle model, where no longer we're we saying, here's my walls, my perimeters, no vulnerabilities, I'm safe. This is saying, no, the adversary is going to do some post-exploit stuff. And if you start looking for these things, you're going to increase your, your overall security. So attack is great, but how do we actually use it? And one of the things I like to say is that attack kind of sits at this intersection of four key use cases. Um, you know, threat intelligence, measuring de defenses, detection and hunting, and security engineering. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I put on this slide. Let me dive into it, actually. Detection and hunting, that's really kind of talking about SOC teams, you know, kind of your detection team. Really, uh, you know, focusing on that detection aspect. Uh, you know, hunting falls in here, developing analytics, tooling configurations, as well as kind of how, you know, the, the, the analyst looking for things. <laughs> And, and that's one of the key use cases, is really kind of focusing on that detection point of view. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example in a further slide. Uh, pen testing, or, or maybe more accurately, red teaming, is another big use case. And that's measuring defenses. Really, if you're using attack, your red team can go in there and help say, OK, you know, here's what my, I think my defenses are. And your red team can say, hey, here's what your defenses actually were able to, to, to detect. And you know, one of the things, one of the use cases I like to highlight here is that with attack, you can have your red team actually conduct engagements, engagements to emulate known adversaries, and that's because of all that publicly available threat reporting data that we built off of, where we say, hey, here's this adversary, here are these things that we've seen them do. One of the nice things is that you know, kind of attack helps each of these different use cases inform the other use cases. Here, measuring defenses can actually help inform your detection and hunting by telling you, hey, you're missing these things when you're, when you're, tr when you're running your detections and when you're doing your hunting. Cyber threat intelligence is a huge use case for attack. I'm actually not going to talk about it too much in this presentation, 
But there's a lot of cool things you can do with CTI and attack. Um, one of them, you know, ingesting and share beha- sharing behaviors for situational awareness. Instead of sharing like, hey, here's this file hash or hey, here's this IP address, you might want to say, hey, here are these behaviors we've seen associated with this threat actor. Maybe you do link some, you know, file hashes, file hashes and other things in there as well. But really, it's focusing on sharing those behaviors so that you have better understanding what of what adversaries are actually doing. Also. And I have a nice slide about this, is identifying and mapping the changing threat landscape. It's kind of like tracking how adversaries are modifying their behaviors. Maybe two years ago we, we saw an adversary use these TTPs, and maybe today we're seeing them use these TTPs. We can ca- start kind of keeping tabs on what the trends are, and maybe even forecast what adversaries might do in the future. And CTI is really great because it helps inform kind of both your measuring defenses, because you can tell your red, you can have your CTI team tell your red teamers, hey, here's what we think our, our threat actors are doing. You know, the guys that we should really be care to, caring about. Go emulate these threat actors. Don't go do random things. Go actually focus on the adversaries that we think are going to target our networks. And then they can also inform your, your, your detection team as well, kind of from a similar perspective of, hey, here's the adversaries that we're worried about. Are we secure against them or are we not? Then the last one is security engineering. Um, you know, kind of, kind of informing, you know, one of the big use cases for attack here is informing strategic decisions to kind of prioritize your investments. And you, you really want to, a better way to say that might be using attack to guide how you architect your network and what sensors and what tools you deploy, what logs you collect. Attack can help kind of na- help you navigate where you should be looking and what you should be doing there. So this is probably my, my, one of my favorite things to talk about with attack. This is a notional defensive gap chart. Essentially, the idea here is that we can take attack and, and use it as a matrix and basically diagram which techniques we have high confidence we're going to detect, medium confidence, or low confidence. It's very simplistic. You can obviously use like quantitative methods too to say, I think I'm going to detect credential dumping as a 20 and uh, you know, uh, scheduled task as a 30 and then starts assigning weights and all sorts of fun, you know, stuff and metrics. But here it's really simple where we're just using kind of a, a color-coded chart to say, hey, here's what I think my defensive coverage looks like. What's great about attack is you can visualize all these TTPs, all these behaviors in one, like, single snapshot. And I'm going to talk more about this use case in a bit, but kind of di- branching a little bit, another nice visualization is for threat intel. Um, this is a chart, and I don't know if you guys can read it, but in pink is all the things we had really that we had an attack that had mapped back to APT28. We only had six techniques, and I think this was in 2016 or so, but, uh, but an older version of attack. After some threat reporting, I think this was about a year ago, we saw 14 new techniques that we'd seen in publicly available threat reporting. And this goes back to the idea of tracking adversaries and, mod- and watching how they might be modifying their behaviors. You know, this is biased by publicly available threat reporting, but you can take your own networks and do kind of the same thing, where you're tracking the threats, seeing what they're doing, seeing how they might be changing. Hunting is another good one. This could be hunting or, you know, kind of purple teaming. Really, red and blue working together. Attack provides a common language, and here's a simple example where we have this, you know, the matrix view, and we're saying, okay, new service, and from new service is a red teamer, I jump to credential dumping, and then after credential dumping, I jump to account discovery and kind of walking through what red teams and purple team and or what, what the red team is doing in a way that's accessible to the blue team because they're both speaking the same language. And the last security engineering is another fun fun one. This is actually visualized by a tool that we have at, at, that's again free, publicly available. It's called Carrot. Uh, it's at car.mitre.org forward slash carrot. This visualizes groups as they act the Groups, the techniques that those groups have been seen seen to execute, analytics that we have in a data in our uh, in a repository back to the techniques that those analytics can detect, data sources that those analytics need to run, and then sensors that map to those things in the data model. And the idea is if I can kind of expand my sensor model, start thinking commercially available tools, other potential sources of information, I can start drawing a graph like this and helping prioritize what I'm doing as I'm architecting my network and choosing what things to do. So we have this matrix, we have this visualization, it's amazing, but you know, a giant question mark. <laughs> what do we actually do? How do we actually bring this into our environment? If I'm living somewhere where all I'm doing right now is kind of looking at the perimeter, I just have all these defenses, and how do I get started with attack? 
one of the things that I uh, that I think would be great to do is to conduct an attack assessment. And I'm just going to jump backwards, actually. And the idea is, you know, we can talk a lot about attack, but if I can come up with this chart for my network, this can help inform everything else that I'm doing. But how do we actually come up with this chart? How do we figure out where our gaps are, where our, you know, where our strengths are, where are we kind of in, in, in the middle? Where do we actually kind of jump from? And, and this is where, you know, assessments come in. And the idea is, yeah, we can do like red teaming and that can, that can do a lot of that for you. But this idea is something a little bit softer. It's more of an approximation, a first glance, just something that's supposed to be like that to give you that starting point so you can kind of prioritize everything else you're doing. And the idea of the assessment is kind of a four-phase approach. At the highest level is just discussion. You just kind of figure out what you're looking for, what's in scope, what's out of scope. Make sure that everybody in the SOC, all, all, you know, from the, from the CISO down, everybody is kind of on the same page. They understand what's going on, what, the, what, what, what their expectations are. Yeah, we're not, we're not going in there and executing the techniques. We're just trying to approximate what our coverage might be. Once everything is set and you have kind of a schedule and you have kind of a good rhythm, then you're going to want to actually analyze stuff. I'm looking, or, or you'd look there for mainly documentation and sensors that you've, that you've implemented, things like CONOPS, certain operating procedures. You know, do you, do you have a, a document which describes, hey, these are the data sources we're looking for. This is how I stand up a new host on the network. This is, these are all the tools that I'm running. Here are all the tools that my SOC operators are running. You might have a giant list of all these different things that, that, that everybody's doing. Getting all that documentation, bringing it together, and you know, you can do this from two perspectives. If you're in the SOC, you know, it's, it's kind of easy for you to know what you're doing. But if you have many different people, you really need to kind of bring everything together to figure out how to do this. The next is to talk to people and actually interview them. It's great to get documentation. And you might say, oh, we're running all these tools. We have all these analytics. We're gathering all these data sources. But if you go talk to people, you might hear that what's actually being done in the SOC is a little bit different than what people are, are, are kind of claiming they're doing in, in, in writing. Here are kind of things you might want to look for are known coverage. You might talk to people who say, hey, we struggle with this. Or, hey, we're really good at this. You know, um, you know, maybe some people are more familiar with attack. Some are less familiar with attack. Maybe they can talk about that. Or you might just have general things like, you know, we kind of struggle with detecting things kind of on our internal, in our internal network traffic. That can help kind of inform how you're analyzing everything as you understand what your strengths and your weaknesses are. Then another good one is past performance. If you have kind of successes or failures, you can go off of those and see what you did there. And the last thing is kind of processing everything together. Yeah, we have all this stuff. How, you know, now we need to bring it all into one, you know, one complete picture. And uh, you don't just want to kind of get that coverage chart, but you also want to develop prioritization plans that tell you what to do after you've done that. There's two key points I like to make here. The first is that this process is designed to minimize stakeholder involvement. You don't want to be overburdening the SOC personnel with some kind of analysis where you're spending a year just kind of, all right, sit down with me for three hours a day and I'm going to tell you what you're doing because then no one's doing their job. You know, the idea here is really to, to focus on that analysis phase and when you're interviewing people, really keep that to the minimum. You want an hour, two hours, you know, per person. That, that's it. You really don't want to be saying, all right, walk me through your day to day because once you start doing that, it's just too much involvement. At the same time, you want to try to maximize your usable results. And that means you do have to talk to people. You can't just analyze the documentation because that only tells you so much. But, you know, really kind of maximizing how you can use those results too. And the other key thing, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, is coming up with a prioritization plan is a huge deal. Because it's one thing to just say, hey, here are your gaps. And then, okay, whoop de doo Like, I'm, I'm missing these things. What do I actually do about it? Where should I, where should I go from here? You know, you don't want to just do that, but you also want to come up with, okay, now we need a plan for making things better. And that's a big part of this as well. A little bit more information on analyzing documentation. The, you're looking here for things like tooling, processes, procedures, methods, things like that. Kind of the big thing is to focus on how tools are used and what analytics are running. That's what you'd really want to look for. And, you know, how tools are used, that's, that's hard when you're just looking at documentation. But if you can get that, that's great. Here, analytics provide empirical details on what is or is not, not, not detected. It's easy to look at an analytic that's, you know, one or two, you know, I don't know how many lines an, uh, an average analytic might be, but a few lines long and say, okay, I think this is going to detect this technique or this technique. That can really be, be pretty straightforward. 
And then specific tools, those tend to use detective methods that directly map to attack. And I'll provide an example with like registry-based detection methods that if you say, hey, you know, this can detect things that modify the registry, okay, then I've got kind of medium confidence that you can detect these things. And the goal here is really to understand how the SOC operates before really, visit's a bad word, but really, you know, before kind of overburdening people and interviewing them. If you can focus your interviews, you're going to do much better than just going in there kind of blanket and saying, all right, let's get to know each other and I'm just going to ask you some boilerplate questions. If you do, if you do the analysis beforehand, then you're going to know exactly what you should be looking for. When you're interviewing, you're really meeting with the security teams to understand the general readiness. And I like to bucket this into three main categories. The first is empirical evidence that's like, hey, do you know of any existing attack gaps? It's kind of hard to ask, and if people know of all the gaps, then your job's gonna be really easy, but you know, t sometimes people will know one or two. Or maybe you talk with them and say, hey, what do you think of WMI? They say, oh, you know what, I, 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 I think we can catch that, or I, I, you know, we, we ran a red team exercise, we weren't able to catch that. The next big bucket is general evidence, and that's things that are just kind of general blind spots that might be, you know, kind of general things that are being missed. And then lastly, tooling and method details. How does the team operate and how do you use and configure tools? A lot of tools, like, are they being deployed off the shelf or are you customizing them a little bit? That'll change how you end up evaluating how that tool is being used. When you're processing results, you tend to have kind of four big buckets of things. The first is interview results. That's combined gen empirical and general evidence all mapped back to attack. The next is data analytics. These are analytics, signatures, you know, things like that. And then you can kind of map those back to the attack model. Tooling and sensors, it's the same thing. That's just another big bucket. And then SOC procedures that help you kind of understand how the analytics and the tools are used. And that's kind of vague, so I'm going to walk through a couple of examples. This isn't a real assessment. This is just kind of some, some you know, snapshot pictures of the matrix that can kind of provide an idea of what you'd be looking for. This first chart, th this is from a, there's a link down here on, on CrowdStrike. They have something called Falcon, and they have kind of a mapping of, hey, here's what the attack coverage is against a specific APT. It's the APT3 evaluation in, in particular. And this is, you know, if, if you're assessing an environment that's running this tool, this is really easy because that's already available for you. This provides a nice little snapshot. You can see we've got, you know, things in green. Those are things that are detected. Things in yellow, you know, detection was possible, but it wasn't really doing it. Uh, red are things that were tested. Those are capability gaps. And then some things also weren't tested just because they were kind of out of scope. And then other things weren't tested just because for other reasons. And so this is great if this is, you know, available. If you have, if you've already done an assessment of a tool, that's another common, common situation that you might have is you've said, hey, I've seen this tool before. I know what its attack coverage looks like. You know, I don't need to do it again. And so that's a great place to start from. But more often than not, you might say, okay, we're running these, you know, endpoint, endpoint detection things. Like what... What's, what's their coverage look like? And here's the example I mentioned about registry-based defenses. You might say, okay, here's a tool. It monitors the registry. It just kind of just does stuff with the registry. And you're not really sure how good its coverage might be. But you might have medium confidence that, you know, any of these things that really kind of fiddle with the registry, these are things that you probably shouldn't be focusing on if you're trying to remediate gaps. These are probably things that, yeah, it can maybe detect, so I probably shouldn't worry about them. So if you can look at the data sources that some of the tools are running, or some of the tools are looking at, then you can figure out where you should be kind of prioritizing your, your, your or not prioritizing, but really where the coverage strengths and weaknesses of that tool might lie. I say analytics a lot. Here's a sample analytic. Um, you know, this is just kind of some pseudocode. You can see uh, it's, you know, kind of searching for, you can't see my mouse. It's searching for flows. It's, you know, looking for destination port 445, and the protocol is an SMB write protocol. You know, you might come into an, you, you might look at your environment to see if, you know, a bunch of analytics and you get code like this. You might say, okay, this looks like it's looking for an SMB write request, and you think a little bit more about it and say, okay, SMB write, re write request, this can detect remote file copy, uh, pretty well, you know, that, that'll detect it most of the time. Windows admin shares, it's got a moderate level of, com uh, you know, coverage there, it's medium. And then valid accounts, that's another one that, okay, that, that'll provide some coverage of that technique. And, and so if you can do this for all your analytics, that can help you understand what your coverage is. As a note, I've cheated here. That analytic is actually from MITRE's cyber analytic repository. We have kind of a repository of analytics. 
It's available at car.mitre.org, so please feel free to go there and look at some analytics. So if you take all the analytics that you find in an environment and you throw them all into one spreadsheet or one matrix view, you get kind of a picture of what the overall analytic coverage is. And here I've taken five different, um, different analytics and kind of created a coverage map for those five and saying, okay, these are all the things that those analytics can detect. More often than not, when you analyze all the analytics that are running, some of them, or many of them might, hopefully, map to the attack framework, but others might not too well. And that's really going to be kind of a, a creative process, trying to figure out which of those map to the matrix and which ones don't. This is a very simple example of what you might expect when you're interviewing uh, personnel. And I've, I've kind of cheated and done something very basic. You'd probably get more interesting things when you talk to real people. But in this example, I'd say, you know, we interviewed them and they said we kind of have mediocre success. We, we have kind of medium confidence that anything going across the perimeter, we have decent coverage. You know, we have, you know, and it's not high confidence, but maybe medium confidence. And so here, I said, okay, anything that's going across the network, you know, anything that's really going at the perimeter or might go across the perimeter, I'm just going to say that's medium confidence of detection. It's very simple and straightforward. You can do more interesting things like, you might talk to people and they say, you know, we, we, we struggle to detect discovery. And, you know, you just kind of highlight that and say, okay, that's red. That's something they said they struggle with. But here I've said kind of, you know, perimeter-based, we're okay with it. And so how do, you know, I've, I've kind of given you these data sources. How do we bring it all together? And here's kind of, you know, we start with one of the tools. We add another tool here. I've taken that, that Falcon. I've added the registry. All the things that they both can detect and they both miss, you kind of bring them together. It's the same with analytics. You know, you kind of can see the coverage expands as you bring each of these in. And at some point, you know, you might have to resolve conflicts. And, you know, essentially here, I'm just building. Everything's nice and, you know, increasing all the time. So if I do have coverage, I just add it. Sometimes you might find something saying I do have coverage, but then something else saying I don't have coverage. In some cases, you might want to prioritize not having that coverage. And then when you bring in the interview results, here's what the end thing looks like. And, and one thing I'd highlight here is that uh, the, the coverage before this slide was no, no confidence, you know, really, really low confidence of exfiltration over command and control. And that was from that tool that said, we don't have any confidence here. And nothing else said they had confidence. But then when I said, hey, you know, the interview, the, when we interviewed them, they have medium confidence that they can detect all these things across the perimeter. Then I might say, okay, that's something that, you know, maybe we have medium confidence as opposed to no confidence. And so that's a pretty simple example. So it's not enough to just say, hey, here's all your gaps. You know, what do you actually do? How do you go about fixing your network? And essentially, you know, my answer to that is you need a prioritization plan. You need to focus on remediating specific gaps. And as a simple example, you know, the question is, if I have all these things in white, all these things that I have low confidence, which ones should I actually focus on? And one idea is to focus on those that are more commonly used. This is a notional chart, it's very old, but kind of things that are, you know, uh, you know, highlighted more, those are more commonly seen. This is a little notional, but, you know, credential dumping, file and directory discovery, registry run keys, and slash start folder, these are all techniques that are pretty commonly seen. Um, we also just, if anyone's interested in this slide, we have something called the attack navigator that's free and publicly available that takes in layer files, and we have a layer file that has more, that has better data. So talk, talk to me afterwards and I can tell you a little bit more about that. But, yeah, and that's one thing you can do is try to find which techniques are more commonly used. Obviously this is biased by whatever data is currently in the attack model. Another thing is focusing on specific groups. Here I've taken kind of APT28 and Deep Panda, put, you know, APT28 in blue, Deep Panda in yellow, and then techniques that both of them execute in green. Here I'm saying I want to focus on both of these threat actors and if I'm coming up with a prioritization plan, I'm going to focus on the techniques that both of them execute as opposed to techniques that neither of them or just one of them execute. Obviously, you can also take another way which might say I'm going to focus on the techniques that APT28 executes as opposed to the techniques that Deep Panda executes. And when you're done, hopefully you'll have a prioritized coverage map. Here this is again, you know, notional, but where you highlight a technique here and there and say these are the ones that we really need to go for right away. I want to focus here and, you know, what I, these are the things that I'm going to get the biggest bang for my buck. And, and that's a great place to kind of be. Once the assessment is done, you come up with a remediation plan. 
I've got a lot of words here, but the main thing that you want to do after that is really implementing an attack mindset. You really want to move away from that perimeter, you know, pre-exploit, you know, that I, no one's ever going to get in. Moving away from that and saying, okay, people might get in, and we really should focus on having this threat-based awareness and a threat-based methodology in our SOC. Um, I'll skip some of these points, but some of the things you might want to do are improving coverage by acting on the coverage map. It's pretty straightforward. That's just kind of increasing your coverage. Having increased awareness of your defensive gaps is really good. If you have that as a, as a day-to-day -day basis, you kind of have more awareness of the kinds of things you should be looking for on a day-to-day -day basis. And then verification is important because this is, you know, what I've talked about. It's a bit of an approximation. You know, going in there with a the red team and verifying this is certainly helpful. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some use cases that you can do after an assessment. Um, the first is developing analytics. And I don't know if any of you were at B-Sides because my colleagues presented some of these slides already, so it might be duplicative. I've said the word analytics a lot. And, uh, you know, when we talk about analytics, they're, they're great. But, you know, there's kind of a spectrum between in, a, analytics and indicators. And uh, I don't talk to this slide too well. But analytics tend to really focus on that behavioral-based perspective as opposed to that known malicious that indicators talk about. There, you know, there's more false po positives. They're broader, and you tend to have kind of a lower quantity than you have for indicators. They're still really useful, but you know, you really kind of have to target them when you're developing them. And the general recommendation for if you want to go with an attack, uh, an attack assessment, figure out what your coverage is, and then start remediating gaps. You should just start somewhere. And here, you know, you know, well, start somewhere. Pick a technique, and you know, ideally, you'd go from the remediation plan that you have. Focus on one of those techniques. Here's uh, bypassing user account control. And I think I, this is an old slide deck, and I had more there. Anyway, when you're developing an analytic, the first thing you should do is really read the attack page and understand the attack. When you're, rather, when you're developing an analytic, you should try to target a technique. And when you do that, you should really understand the attack that you're trying to target. Um, you want to look at the references for use using, using it. Think from an adversary perspective and try to separate legitimate usage from malicious usage. And that's going to be a big one because a lot of the things that we have in attack are things that can also be done legitimately. Trying it out is also very important. You don't just want to throw analytics at your network. You'll, you should implement them and then refine them and say, okay, here's the false positives, here's the false negatives. Try to kind of find a nice balance between the two. And then writing and iterating is also important. You, know, you write your first search and then you narrow your false positives and you iterate. And you know, kind of the big hope here is that you start with your initial coverage matrix, and this is great, but after developing some analytics, you can kind of help increase your coverage matrix. And instead of going in and doing another assessment you know, from scratch, you can take your initial assessment, understand what your analytics are detecting, and then update your coverage chart based on what those analytics were actually detecting. Another use case is adversary emulation. Um, you know, that's kind of red teamy-ish. But I, I, I love the coverage maps and the heat maps. I think they're great. They're awesome places to start. But they tell a somewhat incomplete picture. The reality is if I say this technique is green, I can't just like walk away, you know, clap my hands and say, no one's ever going to use this technique. You really need to go in there and test, hey, this technique really is invulnerable. I, 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 I can't detect this. And I, you know, I, I can detect this. You're not going to get away with executing it. And... Uh, you know, attack techniques, they really have many different ways of being executed. And this is different for each technique. You know, so some of them like credential dumping. There's lots of ways you can do credential dumping. But reading, um, you know, the bash history, that's, well, you're, you're reading the bash history. I guess there's different ways you can read the bash history, but it's really reading the bash history. So coverage maps, they, 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 they paint a great picture initially, but they're kind of incomplete. And the best way to really move beyond a coverage map is to use adversary emulation, which you also might want to say is like threat-based red teaming. Here, you want to actually go, go and execute real techniques on your network, go verify whatever coverage you have, say, okay, I think this is green. Okay, red team, go emulate an adversary that executes that technique and prove to me, yeah, it's green. You're not, you're not going to get away with executing that technique. And attack is great here because, again, it provides this common language to not only talk with the, the red team, but to also, you know, well, to, it provides a common language to talk with the red team, but also provides that structure for how the red team should be behaving because we have that mapping back to the groups. 
So using attack for adversary emulation, there, there's four um, you know, big, big things here. First is scope. Attack can help you understand the scope of what the red team exercise can look like. You might not just want to execute everything. You might want to execute only specific things that the adversary is executing. Communication, I've, I've mentioned that one a few times. Repetition is also important. If you're running a red team exercise and the red team just does whatever they want for each exercise, it's going to be hard to understand how your network has changed over time and how your red team might be changing. By using attack and structured adversary emulation, you can help create exercises that are more repeatable. And so now you can say, okay, here's, here's what this exercise looked you know, a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and kind of compare how you've been doing over time. And the last thing is measurement, kind of since you, you can kind of see, okay, I caught 10 techniques and missed five techniques. The 10 techniques I caused, those were low-hanging fruit. Those other five, I really need to focus on those. I'm not going to dive into the details too much, but I will say we've developed you know, adversary emulation plans. Right now we've published an emulation plan for APT3. Uh, this kind of walks through how you can do kind of more how you can emulate APT3. This works at the technique level, also at the procedural level. We have a few things in there as well. There's a lot of cool stuff there. And you know, the big thing here is if you do want to use adversary emulation, it's great to either use an existing emulation plan or come up with your own to actually tell your red teamers, hey, these are the things you should be doing and help provide structure to the actual exercise. Once you run an exercise, you'll probably get something that looks a little bit like this. This is yet another view of the matrix. But you'll get some sort of coverage map which says, we caught these things, we missed these things, we kind of, you know, maybe could have caught these things better. And it'll help you map back to your original coverage to figure out, hey, you know, I'm actually going to validate this gap or this, this strength. And it, once you're done, once you've done that initial assessment, you don't just stop there. You keep doing it. Use a different implementation of the same attack technique. And I mentioned this again. Some, a lot of these have many different ways that you can execute. And then update your, your, your analytic. You know, if you run the technique and you catch it, that's great. Then if you run the technique again with a different implementation and you miss it, now you should update what your coverage looks like. By repeating this process, you can slowly improve what your coverage looks like. I'm just about closing. Um, I didn't talk about it too much, but CTI is a huge thing for attack. Part of what we're hoping for is moving towards more or, or more threat informed defenses. You know, you take in CTI, you describe things in attack, you put that out to your realistic threat model, you also push it down to your intelligent, you know, adversary or intelligence driven adversary emulation plans to kind of help you structure those in a more kind of realistic way based on your CTI. And all that feeds into an ever improving and well validated defense. I've talked a lot about attack, and I keep saying attack, and there's a lot more to attack than what I've been talking about. I've mainly been talking about enterprise attack that talks about Windows, Linux, and Mac. We also have mobile attack. That's another framework that's, again, available at attack.miter.org, as well as pre-attack, which does that same kind of tactic and technique uh, enumeration for the left of exploit behaviors. And this is just a quick view. You can see you know, there's pre-attack on the left. There's many more tactics and then attack for enterprise on the right. We have lots of resources um, around attack. First is kind of that publicly available attack knowledge base. It's attack.miter.org. We've also recently converted everything in attack into sticks format. So now you can work with attack dynamically. Someone likes that because I don't know about anyone else, but I actually had a web scraper that was like scraping the wiki, which that wasn't fun. But now it's all in sticks, so you can automatically write scripts and do all sorts of fun analysis, do all sorts of fun, cool things. I mentioned the adversary emulation plans. That's another thing we have. We're working on some more automated adversary emulation. We have a project called Caldera, which attempts to kind of automate the adversary emulation process, you know, end-to-end -end adversary assessments. That's, we have a open source version available online. That's, and I can talk at length about that, too. Um, Caldera is awesome. It, it kind of attack is kind of the things that it executes. I don't want to get started. I mentioned CAR as well, the cyber analytic repository. That's kind of a, a database we have or a repository of analytics that I'll map back to attack techniques. The last one is the attack navigator visualization tool. You know, if anyone else has tried to visualize stuff with attack, it can be challenging with Excel and PowerPoint and, you know, matrices and, and other diagrams. We now have a tool. It's available online. Again, it's open source. Uh, that allows you to visualize all sorts of cool stuff. You can do heat maps. You can do kind of, uh, we well, can do heat maps in all sorts of different ways, gradients, scores, hiding techniques, showing different techniques, emphasizing. 
We recently um, added a feature where you can export the 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 layer that you're working on actually as an Excel spreadsheet if you do want to work it into a PowerPoint. So that's that's all cool. And then links and contacts. There's tons of stuff. I'm not going to go through each. I'm Andy. Um, there's my email. I have a Twitter account, Andy plays E4. Although I, I play the Queen's Gambit now. Um, attack. Lots of things at Miter Attack. We're very active on Twitter. Cyber Analytic Repository. The emulation plans. Caldera. I didn't talk about it. Uh, we have something else called Cascade, which kind of automates a you know kind of threat hunting process, and it builds from the Cyber Analytic Repository. That one's also open source, so please you know take a look at that. Then a lot of stuff on CTI at the end. And then the last thing is I, I, I just want to say is MITRE's awesome. We're a not-for-profit organization. We are hiring, so if people think attack is cool. You know. Anyway, that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Also have stickers. <laughs>